respectable man. I would like to thank everyone who has expressed their sympathy following my wife's death. Devoted to his wife. Mrs. Dupin had a history of depression. A personal tragedy. The woman has shot herself. It's obviously a suicide. Or an act of depravity. I think there's a question mark over the time of death. Amanda Burton. Don't patronize me. New crime doubles. Someone on your investigation is trying to undermine me. Silent Witness, Monday at 10 past 9 on BBC One. Agent Henry, as you know, the last assignment was successful. We unearthed some dynamic new talent for the BBC. But our mission is not over yet. Agent Henry, we're counting on you. We need you to hunt out actors to join the stars on our most popular dramas. Ferret out the fanatics who could make great sports reporters. Down those cocking comedy writers. Single out the hottest new talent on the urban music scene. And find me the kids who want to take over TV. Ah, there you are, Agent Henry. All right, boss. Good to see you're on top of things. BBC Talent. Still on a mission to find the best of the nation's talent. We see one. This is BBC One in the Midlands. Now the news at 10 o'clock with Peter Sissons and Ashley Blake. The shadow of foot and mouth spreads further. 22 new cases today. It's now more than 200 outbreaks, 120,000 animals slaughtered. And it's crossed the channel with the first case in mainland Europe. The £60 billion plan to rebuild Britain's stressed-out railway. Three goals for Manchester United put them through to the Champions League quarter-finals. And here in the Midlands tonight, foot and mouth disease costing tourism millions of pounds a week. And delays and cancellations to the ten-year wait for improvements to our railways. Good evening. Britain now has more than 200 outbreaks of foot and mouth disease and France has had its first, bringing fears on the continent that the disease won't stop. Now it's got a foothold there. In what's now the third week of the outbreak, there were today 22 new cases in the UK, 11 of those in Cumbria, bringing the total to 205. The gravity of the situation was tonight underlined by the United States and Canada, which banned all meat imports from the European Union. Here, the opposition leader, William Hague, suggesting measures to reinforce the government response, called it a growing national crisis. The gunfire rolls across Cumbria's fields from morning till night. Here, mass slaughter has become part of everyday life. When they are dead, they are burnt. The smoke darkens the sky, drifts back across the farm. At least here, they can destroy their dead. The backlog of slaughtered animals means many are left around on the land for days. We would call upon anybody. The government should call in additional contractors. Yes, the military, yes, the army, if they are available, let's have them, because that is extra manpower. The measures designed to tackle this disease are leaving some farmers in impossible situations. These ewes in Devon are due to lamb. They can't be moved, even though there's little grazing left for them in the field. But the farmer has a restriction order. He can't take them extra food, and animals are starting to die. It's awful to see, think of sheep stuck out there, lamb on their own, no one to help them, and, and they just die an awful death, isn't it, really? But what can we do about it? There's nothing we can do. In this atmosphere, the Prime Minister hosted crisis talks at 10 Downing Street with all the concerned groups. A task force looking at the wider impact has begun its work. The government is convinced its policy is still on track. Mr Brown, many in the countryside do feel this is slipping out of control. Will there come a point when you review, fundamentally review, the way you're tackling this disease? The, the strategy we're pursuing is the correct one. Uh, I know it is hard. The control measures uh, are very firmly in place. What, of course, we're dealing with is the emergence of a, of a viral uh, disease that is already incubating. 
The opposition still broadly support the government's policy, but they are now calling for stronger measures in areas where outbreaks are feared. I think we need to adopt a policy of slaughter on suspicion, uh, where a vet suspects foot and mouth uh, in a flock or in a herd. I think the slaughter policy should commence at that point, rather than waiting another two days for the results to come back. He too thinks the army should be brought in to help clear away slaughtered animals. It's thought 40,000 may have been killed but not moved. Clearing the remains is now a major issue. Here in Devon, the latest convoy of carcasses is being prepared. They are to be transported halfway across the country to a rendering plant in Cheshire. It is the only one in the country and is working 24 hours a day. As this crisis deepens, the level of slaughter and destruction is building up in the British countryside quicker than it can be dealt with. Richard Bilton, BBC News. The first case of foot and mouth in France was the realisation of Europe's worst fears. It's thought the disease which was discovered in cattle had spread from a neighbouring farm which had recently imported British sheep. The European Union tonight banned all exports of French livestock. From the scene of the outbreak in the northwest region of Mayenne, our correspondent John Sopel reports. They hoped and prayed it wouldn't happen here. But as this herd of cattle burns after six were found to have the disease, comes the grim realisation this is now a European problem too. Foot and mouth disease has crossed the channel. You cannot pass here, this is an exclusion zone. And no one can go past? Nobody. There's a one and a half mile cordon around the farm, but this was put in place last week as part of a series of drastic measures to prevent the disease ever taking hold. But it has. And now in the Mayan department, a crisis center monitors and waits, fearing there may be more. But the senior government representative is not blaming anyone. I don't blame. It's a matter between uh, your government and, and mine. Uh, my only uh, subject is to prevent my department from the, an explosion of this disease. And are you worried there could be an explosion? Yes, yes we do. These pictures of the affected farm were taken two weeks ago when foot and mouth was just a worry, not a reality. Today, neighbouring farmers fear they may be next. Louis LaRue, whose farm is just a mile away, says that after mad cow disease, this is a catastrophe. But farm union leaders are keeping their fingers crossed. We are still confident. If we can restrict this uh, outbreak of the disease in France to one or few cases, uh, it will be a success. And so now even more drastic measures will be implemented. From tomorrow, pigs will be slaughtered in this area. The movement of all dairy and beef products is being halted, as well as a European-wide ban on export of livestock. The worst for France has happened. John Sopel, BBC News, in the Mayenne, in northwest France. And our Europe correspondent, Justin Webb, joins us from Brussels. Justin, now that the disease has got a foothold on the continent, in France, does the EU have a plan to keep it there? They do have a plan. It's a plan of containment and control. The message from this city this evening is that there should be no overreaction. And although the measures announced and outlined by John Sopel there for France are drastic, they're not as drastic as some might have suggested the vets who met uh, here today decided against a vaccination program which would have all sorts of wider implications and they also decided against any kind of mass slaughter they are hoping against hope that they can still win this battle in france now talking of reactions the americans have banned all eu animal products and uh, within the last few minutes it's been announced that they plan to disinfect travelers who've been on farms in the european union how will that go down in Brussels? It's already gone down badly. Uh, an EU spokesman said a few minutes ago, told us that they were disappointed, but not terribly surprised by the decision to ban um, EU meat exports and live animal exports. The fact of the matter is that the American market doesn't count for an awful lot um, in cash terms. But it's the way the whole thing looks, with people, as you were saying, being asked to go through special processes when they arrive in America and with EU products banned. It just doesn't look good 
for the, the uh, European Union to face that from the most powerful country on the face of the earth. Justin Webb, thank you. As the crisis continues, the economic impact is spreading ever wider. Companies not directly linked with agriculture are increasingly threatened. Tonight, one business group pleaded with the banks and the taxman to take a sympathetic line. In the heart of the Peak District, the footpaths are closed and one of Britain's most valuable industries is under threat. This small firm making laminated maps for walkers is just part of a tourism industry supporting millions of jobs. With visitors staying away, sales have almost dried up and the workforce has already been cut. The owner fears for the future. It's going to mean basically that if, unless trade picks up in the next three or four weeks, I, I won't have a business. Um, I've already laid three people off completely and the remaining staff that I have will go on to three days but I can only manage that possibly for a week to two weeks maximum. The virtual shutdown of parts of rural Britain is affecting thousands of small businesses. From hoteliers to hauliers, the lack of revenue is beginning to bite. The government is considering measures to help, but one business organisation wants action from banks and the tax authorities to give firms a breathing space. If something isn't done to help those businesses by banks and government agencies particularly, then I can see thousands of businesses going to the wall and jobs being lost, and that has to be bad for everybody. Industries much bigger than farming are now under threat. Agriculture contributes £9 billion to the economy and supports just over 300,000 jobs. Sports and recreation is a £21 billion industry employing over 370,000 people. And hotel and catering contributes £24 billion with a workforce of 1.2 million. Research by this bank says the economic impact will now play a part in decisions on interest rates. The foot mouth disease is going to affect more than just agriculture. It's come at a bad time. Uh, we've seen a series of shocks on the UK economy. Uh, it's also coming at a time when the US slowdown could impact on economic growth. Therefore, the Bank of England will be monitoring this situation very closely. The countryside now depends on visitors from near and far for its livelihood. If foot and mouth keeps those visitors away for much longer, the rural economy will soon begin to seize up. Rory Kathleen Jones, BBC News. And our political editor, Andrew Marr, joins us from Downing Street. Andy, the official government line is that there's no crisis and that it's all under control. Is that the reality behind the closed doors? It isn't quite how it feels anymore. I mean, there is no uh, crisis to the extent that they still think they know uh, where it came from and how it spread, and they believe the measures they've taken will contain and eventually end it. But as somebody was pointing out to me a little while ago, it's a little bit like a forest fire which is raging in front of you and you think it's contained in this area but you'd no idea it was going to be this big and this hot and you're beginning to look out of the side of your eye and thinking goodness is it coming behind me as well that's sort of the atmosphere in Whitehall tonight if this goes on is it conceivable that the government could hold a general election which is not absolutely necessary while the countryside is a smoking disaster area well, the problem is this. They desperately want to hold a general election in May. Everything is set for May. They don't have things to do as a government um, after May. Um, at the same time, what they don't want to do is to hold a tasteless, uh, unwanted election, which is seen by many people as being unfair. And there's already signs that some of the more fringe political players might even use the new European human rights legislation to take the government to court for an unfair election if they tried to hold one when large parts of the country were effectively quarantined. Uh, and briefly, would you expect the broad all-party consensus on the handling of this emergency uh, to come under strain? It's breaking down at the edges. William Hague's phrase um, about going for slaughter um, when that's necessary much faster is more like what the French are doing, and it's what some farmers' leaders are now urging behind the scenes. Go for very, very quick slaughter. Otherwise, the epidemiological uh, evidence is that it's just going to spread and spread and spread. We're going to be talking about millions of animals. Andrew Marr, thank you. Plans to spend £60 billion on modernising Britain's ageing rail network have been published by the Strategic Rail Authority. Its chairman said privatisation had failed and only a new partnership between government and business could end decades of underinvestment. The authority said the Hatfield crash was a pivotal episode which proved Railtrack wasn't capable of updating the network on its own. 
This morning, testing the repaired track at the site of the Selby crash. Another disaster cleared up. And this evening, passenger trains running again as the industry plans its future. The strategic rail authorities decided the job of both operating and developing the railway is too big for rail track alone. So it wants more private companies to step in. We're saying this is how we propose the industry should face up to it. This is how we propose to bring together the people who will invest in providing, but it's going to take a while before provision is really clearly felt all around. Future developments of lines like the West Coast could be paid for and built by banks and construction firms, backed with government grants. It's seen as the biggest public-private partnership in Europe. The authorities' 10-year target is to deliver 50% more passengers and 80% more freight, with £60 billion of investment pumped in. There will be a lot of extra capacity on the railway. There will be a lot of new rolling stock on the railway. The travel experience will feel a lot better and an awful lot more work done to upgrade stations. So in 10 years' time, it will be a lot better. Passengers heading home tonight may well hope so after a privatisation that's delivered little so far and four big accidents in four years. Since last October's Hatfield crash, Railtrax realised that it doesn't have all the skills and all the money to expand the network on its own. But even if other private companies do help out, at least half the cash will have to come from the government. And it's the strength of that commitment which many in the industry are still not sure about. Simon Montague, BBC News, London. The Leeds United footballer Lee Bowyer has told Hull Crown Court that he took no part in an alleged assault on a student outside a nightclub in the city. During his evidence, Mr Bowyer was asked by his defence lawyer to put on the clothes he said he wore that night. He denies causing grievous bodily harm with intent and a fray. He's on trial with two other Leeds players plus two other men. The world's major airlines have agreed to collaborate on research into possible links between long-distance air travel and the potentially life-threatening condition, deep vein thrombosis. Recently, a number of passengers have died from blood clots after flying long distances. The Princess Royal has been fined more than £400 and been given a five-point penalty on her driving licence for speeding. The Princess was caught in her Bentley driving at 93 miles an hour on a dual carriageway near Cheltenham last August. Two big telecom companies are cutting thousands of jobs. Cable and wireless is losing 4,000 jobs worldwide, 2,000 of them in Britain. And the American-owned Motorola is cutting its British workforce by 700. The announcement came as technology shares continued to struggle on world stock markets. More bad news from the telecom sector. Today, US-based Motorola announced plans to cut 7,000 jobs worldwide. It brings to 12,000 the total number shared in its mobile phone business this year. 700 jobs are going at Motorola's plant in Swindon. The future of its 3,000 employees in West Lothian is unclear. Up to 2,500 jobs are also being cut by cable and wireless across the UK. The company, which carries voice and internet traffic on its network, is facing stiff competition. Its share price fell by 20% today. They're both in what were once seen as very glamorous areas. One's in mobile handsets, one's in internet carriage. Uh, at one time, profits were very good in these areas, growth was good, uh, but there's increasing competition, markets are slowing down, and we see the effect on the bottom line. In the space of a year, telecoms, internet, and computing companies have seen their share values plummet. Last March, New York's technology-heavy Nasdaq index peaked at over 5,000 points. It's now around 2,000. The technology bubble had to burst, but now, as investors run for cover, many of these companies are waking up to a new threat, falling sales due to a US economy slowing down for the first time in a decade. John Moylan, BBC News. Some leading neurologists are demanding that a radical implant treatment for Parkinson's disease should be suspended. New research has found that the treatment involving the use of cells from aborted fetuses have, has left some patients with disastrous side effects. The Parkinson's disease Mike Peters has endured for 12 years is incurable, for the moment at least. The difficulty in controlling his limbs is caused by brain cells inexplicably dying. Replacing these was the basis of groundbreaking American research using tissue transplants from aborted fetuses. But news that it suffered a setback has been met with shock. The hope was, this is one, it was going to crack it. 
it's when we're going to uh, make us all better. You know, and uh, so a lot of people, and, and myself, uh, we put, I put a lot of uh, hopes into it. Here at Columbia University in New York, researchers found that though some patients who had cells transplanted benefited, 15% suffered such devastating side effects, like uncontrollable muscle spasms, that this scientist has called for the technique to be stopped. The results of this technique were sufficiently disturbing that I would personally argue that, that unless it were changed in some substantial way, I would not want to see this be done again in, in human beings. The research was incredibly complex. They took tissue from four fetuses and grafted cells from these onto the brain. These multiplied to replace those cells that had died. But in several cases, they grew too fast, causing the awful side effects. In the UK, stem cells taken from embryos just days old are being used. They contain fewer unwanted cells than fetal tissue. They're purer and easier to control. Research using embryos has aroused heated debate, and scientists are being urged to tread carefully. Many of the 100,000 people in Britain with Parkinson's will be disappointed by the American study. But here, MPs recently and controversially voted to relax controls on embryonic stem cell research, opening up new avenues for potential treatments. Karen Allen, BBC News. The Prince of Wales has spoken of his great sense of fulfilment in the work of the Prince's Trust, the charity he founded 25 years ago to help disadvantaged young people. In an exclusive interview with the BBC, Prince Charles said he was certain that its work would continue, but didn't know if his sons would share his passion. He spoke to our royal correspondent, Jenny Bond. <laughs> oh, dig that crazy rhythm. <laughs> really insane. Prince Charles did his best to stay in tune with the younger generation today when he opened a shelter for the homeless in South London. But he confessed that Prince William would probably have fared better. I think my um, oldest son would be better out of me. Centrepoint, which runs the shelter, helped inspire the prince to launch his trust 25 years ago. He said that seeing some of the young people there had made him want to reach out to others. <laughs> Since then, it's supported more than 400,000. Many have been helped to set up in business. Seven years ago, Peter Pomfret was unemployed. Today, he owns a fishing tackle shop in County Durham, thanks to the Trust's money and guidance. I still get the odd phone call to do it, to do things, and um, they've been good. I had a business advisor who'd come out and showed us the pitfalls. So me that returns out and different things like that. In an exclusive interview with the BBC, Prince Charles told me he was amazed by how the trust had grown. When I first started, it was such a small operation, you know, one or two people and a dog, you know, in a shed practically. And now, to my astonishment, it's, it's, it's got so huge. You know, we employ whatever it is, four or five hundred people. Or there's a huge army of volunteers out there. So you can imagine it's a huge job just to encourage and persuade and thank and cajole and I spend my life writing letters to goodness knows who are trying to raise money or whatever but uh, the great secret I think is to, as I said is to keep one step ahead of the game so you don't become irrelevant and there's always an important uh, job I think to be thinking ahead all the time thinking ahead yes so what are the next 25 years are we are we going to see uh, I don't know the King's Trust or have either of your sons shown an interest in this work um, well, I've no idea. I'm not really good at that sort of prediction. But uh, no, I, I, I eventually I hope that um, you know my children will take an interest in it uh, at some point in time. I mean, William may want to start something of his own. You never know, depending on the circumstances he finds at the time as he gets older. Um, but uh, no, I'm, I'm very lucky to have a wonderful lot of people who work for the Prince's Trust, and, and they do a fantastic job, very often in quite difficult circumstances. One way or another, he said, the Trust's work would go on. There was still so much to do. Jenny Bond, BBC News. Now, with news of a Champions League quarter-final place for Manchester United and the rest of tonight's sports news, here's Mary Rhodes. Thanks very much, Peter. Yes, a 3-0 win for Manchester United over Sturm Graz has given them a place in the quarter-finals of the Champions League. And they did it without David Beckham, who was left on the bench. 
Nicky Butt opened up the scoring at Old Trafford for United just five minutes into the game with a confident strike 20 yards out, his first European goal of the season. Fifteen minutes later, Teddy Sheringham added a second, making the most of the plenty of space in the penalty area. And in the dying minutes of the game, United captain Roy Keane made it an emphatic 3-0. And there was one game in the Scottish Premier League tonight. A good result for Aberdeen. They beat third-placed Aberdeen, uh, Hibernian, 1-0. Well, Britain's top two tennis players have been in action in the ATP Masters Series event in Indian Wells, California this evening. Tim Henman had to work hard in his match against Rainer Schuttler of Germany. It went to a third set tiebreak, which Henman eventually won 7-4. He'll meet Cedric Pierlin in the second round. But Greg Rosetsky couldn't find a way to beat Pat Rafter. The Australian won in straight sets, 6-3, 6-2. The Six Nations Rugby Union Championship could be turned into a two-division league championship if the Rugby Football Union gets its way. The RFU has put forward proposals for increasing the number of countries involved in the competition. In order to create promotion and relegation, of course you have to have a second tier. And we then thought to ourselves, well how exciting it would be for emerging nations such as Germany, Spain, Portugal, Georgia, if they formed the second tier, and from that second tier you could actually have promotion and relegation. It would develop the game in Europe, in our view, hugely. And finally some good news for England's cricketers ahead of the third and decisive test against Sri Lanka. Nasser Hussain had been struggling with a groin injury but he got through a net session successfully today and he should be fit for Thursday. Peter. Thank you Mary. And uh, it's just about 25 past 10. I'll be back a little later with an update on the day's headlines but now we join our news teams across the UK. Good evening, I'm Ashley Blake. Hundreds of attractions, parks and nature centres have been closed to the public because of the foot and mouth crisis. Two new cases were confirmed today in Staffordshire and a third in Gloucestershire. The impact of the spread of the disease is now costing the Midlands tourism trade £5 million a week and people are losing their jobs. Catherine Mackey reports. The gates at Dudley Zoo are chained shut to try to keep out foot and mouth. It's been like this for a fortnight with no money coming in through the gates. Currently our financial situation is okay but obviously Easter is very important to us and if we uh, lose significant numbers over Easter then it obviously causes some difficulty. Along with Dudley Zoo about 600 other attractions across the Midlands have had to close because of the foot and mouth outbreak. On the accommodation front 2,000 hotels and bed and breakfasts have found themselves in affected areas. And not surprisingly, on the whole, the tourists are staying away. In the idyllic location of the Morven Hills, the owner of this hotel is living a nightmare. The takings at the weekend were almost 90% down on last year, and staff are being made redundant. There's a car park over there, which on a sunny day like this would be, by midday, would be at least 40% full. People walking on the hills, taking their dogs. We'd be looking forward to them coming down, having a pint of beer, having lunch, some lunch. Um, normal day, now, today, well, nothing. It's a similar story elsewhere, from Shugborough Hall to Drayton Manor Park in Staffordshire. Attractions and events, big and small, have either been closed, cancelled or postponed. Cheltenham Racecourse was empty today when it should have been the start of the three-day multi-million pound festival. Cheltenham's hoping to recoup its losses if the festival's allowed to go ahead next month. But for many others dependent on tourism, the hurdles may seem insurmountable. A dustman has been jailed for life after admitting murdering a man with a cricket bat. Craig Melling, who's 21, killed Victor Mercer, a former police detective, at his home in Litchfield last July. Colin Pemberton was in court. Victor Mercer was a retired Staffordshire police detective in poor health after a heart attack. He had taken solace in alcohol at his home in Litchfield. It was there last July that firefighters discovered his partly burned body in an armchair. He'd been killed as he watched early evening television by Craig Melling, who had befriended him and taken him some food and drink. Melling, himself fighting an alcohol problem, was said to be completely drunk after drinking all afternoon and sharing a bottle of whiskey with Mr Mercer. He picked up a child's cricket bat in the room and began messing about with it. Melling told police he was demonstrating some shots. 
Melling said the cricket bat accidentally flew out of his hands and smashed into Mr Mercer's head. But instead of seeking help, he feared that no one would believe it was an accident. And in a drunken panic, he lashed out with three or four more blows with the cricket bat to his face and head, killing Mr Mercer. Then he tried to set fire to his body and his house to destroy evidence. And he took away with him items which would carry his DNA. Melling's girlfriend and mother of his child was a character witness for him. She said he was kind and considerate and had never been violent. She said she'd stand by him throughout his life sentence. He was killed in a brutal way uh, by Craig Melling and um, he showed a callous disregard for human life. I think it's right that he goes to prison for a long time. Mr Mercer's family said they were satisfied with Melling's guilty plea and his life sentence. Four off-duty police officers struggled with an armed robber today when he tried to hold up a black country petrol station. The gunman escaped empty-handed from Cope's service station in Tipton after threatening the officers with a weapon. He later fired at the driver of a car at these temporary traffic lights before speeding off in a stolen Montego. A Walsall pensioner was taken to hospital tonight with leg and facial injuries after his Rolls Royce crashed into a bungalow just yards from his home. An elderly woman inside escaped injury. She stood up to switch over the television just as the car came crashing through her wall. It's been revealed that much needed improvements to the Midlands rail network will not happen for at least 10 years. Our transport correspondent Peter Plisner reports. New Street in Birmingham is one of the country's most congested stations, handling almost a thousand trains a day, double the number it was designed for. Delays here can have knock-on effects all over the country. One solution is the construction of a new tunnel and platforms under the station. There are also problems on the line between Coventry and Birmingham, where extra tracks need to be built. However, despite the urgency, the new 10-year investment plan from the government's Strategic Rail Authority has said the projects won't happen for more than a decade. It's got to be done as a matter of urgency. Sure, uh, a scheme needs to be worked out so that we actually get something that works in everyone's best interest, but you can't just declare that that's something for 10 years hence or, or longer. I think it's important not to hold out false hopes of things that can be delivered sooner than they in practice can be. I think it's much better to say, look, this project will take 10 years rather than promise it in five and deliver it in 10. Those who expected a rapid program of improvements, including the region's hard-pressed commuters, tonight feel they've been let down by the very organization that just 12 months ago promised to sort the problems out. And tonight's football in the LDV Vans Trophy Northern Section final first leg. Lincoln City nil, Port Vale 2. In Division 2, Wickham Wanderers nil, Stoke City 1. And in Division 3, Kidderminster Harriers nil, Scunthorpe nil, Shrewsbury nil, Cardiff 4. Nice results there. Well, that's it from the Midlands news team. We will, of course, be back just before 6.30 in the morning. That's during BBC Breakfast. Uh, but for now, it's back to Peter Sissons in London for a reminder of the national and the international headlines. Bye for now. And the main news tonight, foot and mouth continues to spread. There were 22 new cases today, bringing the total to more than 200. Ministers announced a rural task force to help bring relief to the countryside. The first case has been confirmed in France. The European Union has banned all exports of French meat. And the Strategic Rail Authority has set out its blueprint for a 60 billion pound investment in the railways. News night is starting now over on BBC Two, but from the 10 o'clock news, good night. Good evening to you after today's sunshine. Don't be fooled into rushing out and planting your potatoes because we're looking at some more frost to come over the forthcoming few nights and in fact getting colder during the daytime at the same time. Frosty for a large part of the United Kingdom tonight and also with the risk of some fog patches, so some difficult driving conditions to watch out for. Those are our temperatures as low as minus two or minus three and that's something we're going to have to get used to because the frost comes back quite widespread I think over the forthcoming few nights. It warms up a little bit in the south with more cloud but then through the weekend the blue returns and that's those nighttime 
of temperatures at or below freezing. Now, the reason for the cloudy conditions in the south will be this area of low pressure, which comes close by, I think, during the course of tomorrow, brings with it a band of cloud and showery rain. Then it's going to linger, I think, for a time through Thursday and Friday. Whilst that's going on, high pressure up here in Iceland will slowly, gradually push its way southwards, and it'll eventually win and push these weather fronts out of the way. But bumping into that low pressure, it squeezes those isobars together, so the breeze is likely to be quite strong through Friday and more especially into Saturday. But it does mean, I think, eventually it'll push all of that weather out of the way and some sunshine to return through Saturday and Sunday. For the moment, though, we have clear skies for those many inland areas. So here we're looking at the frost. More cloud across parts of Scotland and a few showers getting into Northern Ireland. But the area of cloud we're likely to see develop is the one right in the far southwest. It's going to get closer and closer through tonight and more especially through tomorrow and generally cloud things over. It'll start off in Devon and Cornwall, eventually spread through much of southern England and push the level of cloud, I think, further north as well. So we're looking at some cloudy conditions into southern parts of Wales, into the Midlands at times. But from the north of that, it looks like it should be bright and dry with some sunshine, but still lots of showers affecting parts of Scotland during the course of the afternoon. Temperatures, well, we're looking at as much as 10 or 11 degrees. You may see a 12 pop up somewhere. Further north, a little bit cooler, between 8 and 9 degrees, the best being expected in Northern Ireland and southern parts of Scotland. Thursday's forecast brings some more rain in the south. That's that weather front lingering for a time. A little bit cooler generally everywhere, but north of that line of rain, there should be some bright weather, a little bit of sunshine after the early frost, but a sprinkling of wintry showers again across parts of Scotland. And then through Friday and into Saturday, the cold air, the high pressure starts to win, and it starts to push away that line of cloud in the south. So by the time we get to Saturday, we should eventually see all of that cloud and rain beginning to get pushed out of the way. Strong winds in the south, though, and in generally during the night time, the frost returns, and still the risk of those winter showers affecting parts of Scotland and you can find out more on CFAX or online. Bye for now. In faith lies hope. His lordship has done it again. In endeavour lies ecstasy. A touch of brilliance. From chaos, inspiration. When victory is all that matters. That's a fantastic Six Nations continues this Saturday with France, Wales and Scotland, Italy on BBC One. We had something special! No, 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 you had something special. I had something convenient. Why are you trying to hurt me? <laughs> Take cover, Lee Evans is coming to BBC One. I mean, it needs a few adjustments, but I think it's a perfect anti-burglar device. <laughs> One pair of scissors meets 12 dresses. Olga's doing anything to get a contract. Life in Paddington Green on BBC One in 10 minutes. Fair Celebrity Big Brother for Comic Relief. Dear four in the Big Brother house. Oh. <laughs> I think it's an adventure, I mean, it is, isn't it? It is an adventure. It's weird, though. Vanessa and Jack have both been nominated for eviction.